What is going on guys, my name is John and welcome back to yet another video. With the release of Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl this month, I figured I'd start off the new games right by testing myself with the Catch Mall Challenge and then comparing it to the original Diamond and Pearl games and seeing just how much easier or harder it is to complete. Today we're going to find out how easy you can catch every Pokemon in Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. Now if you haven't seen one of my videos before, I've included a playlist in the top right that contains all the previous videos if you're interested, however the rules are pretty simple. The goal at the end of the challenge is to collect a complete living dex of every Sinnoh Pokemon in the remakes within a span of 24 in-game hours. I'll be playing both copies of the game to make it a little bit more difficult, and I've basically split the catches right down the middle so realistically both games have the same amount of work. Obviously no glitches will be used in this, but the games literally just came out so I'm sure it would take more time to find one of those than it would be to do the actual challenge. Before we get into the video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe for more content like this. Roughly only 40% of the people that watch my videos are actually subscribed, and you can always change your mind down the road. Also, before you say it, I know that I haven't uploaded this channel like at all this year, but just know that I'm working on an enormous video that should be out by the end of this year, but I appreciate you all for being so patient with the content. With all that out of the way, let's just jump right into it. Now if you watch me take on the original Gen 4 games, you might be thinking this challenge is going to be exactly the same considering that these games were built around the intention of being faithful remakes. And while that may be true, there are still plenty of additions of the game that make this challenge a lot different than the last time. On top of that, we also don't have to play Platinum this time, which means that realistically we should have a lot more time to complete this challenge. I'm sure this will age well. After naming our characters and waking up in our homes, we can head to our rival's house and make our way to Lake Faraday. Here we meet the professor and their assistant, and after being attacked by a group of wild starly, we're immediately able to choose our starter for the rest of the game. Because of one reason in this game that I'll talk about later, your starter choice doesn't actually matter at all aside from some early game battles, so you're free to grab whatever you'd like the most. In Diamond I chose Chimchar, and in Pearl I chose Piplop, which means that at some point we'll have to get Turtwig, but we'll have plenty of time to figure that out. With our new starters, we can go through the tutorial sections of the game, which include getting our Pokedex to actually begin the challenge, and after talking to our mom, we can learn how to catch Pokemon so we can start making a dent in the total. On Route 202, we can catch Bidoof, and both games will catch Shinx and Starly. The reasoning behind this is actually because of the fact that the Sword and Shield experience share mechanic was brought into the game as well. This means that the entire team will pretty much always be at an equal level, which not only helps for coverage, but also grinding for the entirety of the game. Upon reaching Jubilife City, we can bring the parcel to our rival, as well as take on the clown campaign quest to receive the Pokitch. Unlike the original games, this device has some cool additions that we'll make use of throughout the game. Heading east of the city, we can have our first battle against our rival, and to no surprise with the shared XP, our team had enough firepower to run through his team. In the Orberg Gate, we can talk to this hiker that normally gives us the HM for Rock Smash, however in the remakes they improve this mechanic by tying them to your Pokitch and having wild Pokemon use the moves instead. This removes the need of having the age-old HM Bidoof to help you through the game, but you're still given a few TMs of the original HMs if you're feeling a bit nostalgic. Orberg City is going to be a location of our first gym leader, and this is around the time where both games start to go their own ways. After meeting Roark in the mines, I tried to take on Roark with Chimchar, but after being bodied by his Geodude, it was very apparent that I needed to grind a few more levels in order to deal some more damage. In the originals, you could get the TM for Hidden Power and Jubilife, and hopefully you would get a super effective move, but unfortunately they replaced it with Work Up, which isn't as helpful as you would think it would be. While we're grinding some levels, let's stick with Pearl for a bit and see how much we can get done. Because we chose Piplup and Pearl, the battle against Rourke was insanely easy, and to no surprise, we quickly grabbed the first badge in the region. Upon heading back to Jubilife City, we meet up with Professor Rowan again, and are introduced to Team Galactic, and have a quick battle with them before we can progress. After destroying the rock blocking our path, we can reach Flo Aroma Town, where we have a few tasks that we have to complete. If we head to the meadows, we can save the old man from more Galactic Grunts. After clearing out the area, he'll give us some honey to slather on the trees, and if you know anything about these games, we're going to need a lot of them in order to get some special Pokémon. The process for a Pokemon to appear in these trees takes quite a while, so we'll come back to all the trees that I slathered later on in the run. Heading west of the town, we can enter Valley Windworks, where we can catch Pachirisu and Buizel, and take on the Grunt Guard in the door. But before we do that, it's time to do the most busted thing I've ever done in this series. So if we head back to the town, there's an elderly couple that is now in the bottom left corner of the area. If you happen to have a save file of the Let's Go games on your console, the woman will literally give you a Mew, which is insane. I don't know what's crazier, the fact that they didn't lock this until the post game, or the fact that the other NPC will also give you Jirachi. Did I mention that Manaphy is also an early game bonus, so you can have half of your team be mythicals before the second gym? Neat. Anyways, yeah, so basically all you have to do is talk to her and... Wait. No, she was actually supposed to give it to me. Wait, is, is my game bugged or... Oh my god, I'm on a new Switch. Well... What is going on guys? In Diamond we finally get the first badge and make our way to Route 204 to get Badoo, and without any issues I was able to also get Mew on this version. 
And while Jirachi is also extremely strong, Mew has infinitely better coverage, so we'll be taking advantage of that later on in the game. After completing the same events, we can enter the Valley Windworks and take on Commander Mars. Although originally this battle was kind of annoying because of her Perugly, the Chimchar line now learns Power Punch through Level Up, so this battle was absurdly quick to get through. After skipping nearly every battle on Route 205, we reach Eterna Forest and meet Cheryl, which begins one of the many co-op quests in this game. Thankfully, these trainers heal our team after every battle, so this section is pretty easy to get through. It's also important to note that during the run, I go out of my way to fight quite a few trainers that are completely optional, and while this may seem like a waste of time, there are a lot of Pokemon in the decks that need to be seen, and are much easier to find through trainers rather than encountering them in the wild. For example, this is literally the only trainer in the game that has a Burmy, and there are like 8 other battles like this that we need to do in order to see every Pokemon in the Sinnoh decks. Once we help Cheryl at the end, we can make our way to Eterna City, which is home to the next gym. Thankfully, there are no requirements to enter, so we can just take it on now. Because this gym is centered around Grass-type Pokemon, this gym is basically impossible to lose with Monferno on my team. The fight against Gardenia took a whopping minute and a half to beat, so with that out of the way, we can finish up the rest of the events in the city. North of the city, we meet Cynthia, who doesn't look to be of any importance to the story, and she gives us the ability to cut down trees. Okay, so maybe the next section is a puzzle that requires cut. I wonder what we're going to use it on. We find out that another commander is holding the bike shop owner hostage for some reason, so we enter the Galactic Building to challenge Commander Jupiter. This battle is a little bit more difficult than the last one, but overall the team is strong enough to handle it. As thanks for saving him, the bike shop owner gives us a bicycle for free, and this time around we're able to pick the color, which is pretty neat. I chose the color of the game so you could tell which one I'm playing a bit easier. The last thing we need to grab here is the Explorer Kit from the Old Man next to the Pokemon Center, which leads us into the largest addition to the remakes. The underground has been upgraded to the Grand Underground, and while the core aspects of this little excavating minigame are still present, a lot more content was added. The entire map is filled with dens with different biomes, with an absurd amount of Pokemon to grab. And while you can obviously catch a lot of these Pokemon above ground, the fact that you can see like 8 Pokemon at once makes it a lot easier to find what you need rather than getting into random encounters. With that being said, the Pokemon down here are much harder to catch than normal. I'm not sure exactly why they made it this way, but early on it makes it nearly impossible to catch anything that isn't Shinx or Bidoof. At the time I didn't know this, so I tried catching Murkrow and got absolutely destroyed, but I assumed that it was just bad luck and kept pushing along. In the Grassland Cave, I managed to catch two Cherubi, Roselia, and a male Combi, which means that yes, you can catch some of the Honey Tree Pokemon down here, which saves a lot of hassle and time. There are still Pokemon that are exclusive to the Honey Trees, so it's important that we still slather every tree that we see on our way throughout the game for the best chances of finding them. After spending way too long grabbing all these, the last thing we need to grab is the version exclusive fossil through mining. Realistically, we don't have to do this right now, but once we reach the post game, more fossils are added, so to better our chances, it's best if we look for it now. In the meantime, let's see what Pearl is up to. Oh no. Alright, maybe we should go back a bit. After saving Cheryl, I spent a bit of time catching two Baneri, which is important to grab as early as possible, considering that it evolves through friendship. Because I knew that it was going to be a lot easier to catch the underground Pokemon later on in the run, I decided to skip all of that for the time being and take it on when the team was much better prepared. After making our way through the bike path, we meet Lucas who gives us the Versus Seeker, which is a great item to farm money and XP, but fortunately there are a few tricks that are planned in the run that take care of both of those issues. Inside Mount Coronet, we meet another character who doesn't seem too relevant to the story before making our way to Hardhome City. Right before the gate, if we talk to this man, he'll give us an odd keystone, which is required for an event that we'll focus on much later in the game. In the city, we have a few tasks that need to be completed, but one of the more important ones that should be addressed is in Amity Square. If we head into the northwest area, we can grab the Amulet Coin, which will double our prize money for any battle the Pokemon holding it is participating in. Because the team is pretty diverse, there's really no need at the moment to hold any items that'll make us stronger, so this will help us stock up on extra Pokeballs for the rest of the encounters. Upon leaving the city, we have another quick battle with our rival, and if we talk to this man, he'll give us a mystery egg that we can carry it around until it hatches. On Route 209, we can quickly grab Bonsley, as well as the Good Rod to help fish up a few more encounters later on. Although this area isn't required immediately, I decided to head into the Lost Tower to get a little more XP, as well as unlock Strength at the top floor to have the ability to push boulders once we obtain the next Gym Badge. After taking down the next few routes, we reach Vealstone City, which is the point in the run where the game gets busted. Now, if you remember from earlier in the game, we got Mew, who up until this point has been absolutely useless because its level up moveset is pretty bad. Fortunately, this Pokemon can learn every single TM in the game, which means that we can go into the Vealstone department store and buy whatever moves we want for it. Originally, you could only get the big moves like Thunder and Fire Blast, but they upgraded to now contain the more consistent moves like Ice Beam and even Dazzling Gleam. Naturally, I gave Mew as much coverage as possible, and when I tell you this thing is basically the only Pokemon we're using for the rest of the game, I'm not joking. I would be shocked if this isn't going to be the speedrunning meta for this game. 
And because I'm the first to talk about it, this one now known as the Johnstone Skip. Well, actually, I already I already gave that name to an exploit I found in a Let's Go speedrun when I was streaming, so technically this is Johnstone Skip 2. Unless I do it on stream again, then it's just another Johnstone Skip. Is this the part where I plug my Twitch streams? Just go go follow me there, because I'm streaming until I complete the national decks. Okay, thanks. With our new team, we can head into Maylene's gym, and as you'd expect, Mew one-shots nearly everything in sight. When it came time to take on Maylene, Lucario was a joke, and we were able to grab the third badge without a problem. Now that we've done all this, let's just see how Diamond's doing. After spending way too long in the underground, we were able to get that fossil, as well as some hard skills, which are going to be important for a few Pokemon that evolve after learning a specific move. On the way leading up to Veilstone, we were able to catch Mime Jr. and evolve Cherubi into Cherum, before heading underground once again to grab some more Pokemon. Once you receive the HM for Strength, the underground adds more Pokemon, so back in the Grassland Cave, we can catch Stunky and Skuntank, but I was also able to find a female Combi, which was pretty lucky considering how low of a percentage it is to encounter one. After creating another busted mythical, Diamond was also able to defeat Maylene, and with the experience from the battle, Combi evolved into Vespaquen. It's important to note that the Pokemon in the underground are scaled to your levels, so almost everything we're going to find is going to be around one level before they evolve. Moving forward quite a bit, we eventually reach Pistoria City, which contains a lot of things that we'll have to tackle at one point or another. If we head into the Great Marsh, we can collect the ability to use Defog through our Pokich, and eventually we're going to have to come back here to grab a few exclusive Pokemon to this area. This city also contains the fourth gym, which is focused around Water-type Pokemon. Because Mew knows Thunderbolt, there is once again nothing that Crash Awake's team can do to stop it, and we're able to breeze through this gym in less than 10 minutes. With that taken care of, we can chase after the Grunt in the city before being stopped again by our rival for another battle. After quickly finishing that, we can follow the Grunt to the entrance of Lake Valor and defeat them before meeting up with Cynthia again. She asks us to go to Celestic Town and take care of something for her, and gives us the secret potion to wake up the Psyduck blocking the path so we can access more of the region. Before we do that, I decide to spend a little more time underground to grab some important Pokemon for the total. The most notable encounter was Munchlax in the Spacious Cave, which is honestly the greatest addition they could have added to this game considering how absurdly stupid it was to get in the original games. In addition, you can also catch Apom, which means that the only Pokemon we have to get from the Honey Trees is Burmy, which is substantially easier than it used to be. During all of this, Luxio evolved into Luxray, and in the same area we can grab two Hippopotas. Hip Hippopotases? Hippo hippo Hippopotases? Hippopotas? There are two of them. After clearing out the Psyduck blocking the path, we can head through the routes leading up to Celestic Town, where we end up meeting Cynthia's grandmother and learn about the spirits of the lakes, as well as unlock the ability to use Surf. We have another encounter with Cyrus before leaving for Heart Home to finally take on that city's gym leader. Although this would seem like a problem for Mew, the only Pokemon that somewhat poses a threat is Fantina's Ace, but it's still a two-shot knockout, so we are once again able to solo this gym without too many issues. With our newly unlocked ability to surf, we're basically forced to immediately take on another gym, which means that we have to head west of Jubilife to get to Candlelave City. At the bridge, we have another battle against our rival, which was somehow even easier than last time, and we're once again free to take on the gym. The sixth gym is focused around Steel-type Pokemon, so for the most part, Mew was able to handle it with Flamethrower, but when it came time to take on Byron, I actually had to think a little strategically, considering that Mew didn't really have an answer for Bastiodon. And by strategically, I mean that I spam Flamethrower more than I did for the rest of his Pokemon. After the battle, Monferno evolved into Infernape, which gives us a total of 21 Pokemon. I know it's not an impressive number for six badges, but I promise I'll catch more. Alright, let's see where Pearl's at in the game. Leading up to the sixth badge, Pearl was able to make a pretty decent dent in the total with some new Pokemon. At the Great Marsh, we caught Babarel, two Cricketot, two Shinx, and Gastrodon in the Grand Underground, and Shellos, Floatzel, and two Glamio on the route leading up to Candlelave City. On top of that, one of the Shinx evolved into Luxio, which is basically everything for the time being. I also managed to dig up the version exclusive fossil in this game, but we'll revive that a bit later. During Crash Awake's gym, I noticed that my patch Risu ended up picking up a Dawnstone, which doesn't really save a whole lot of time, but it's more so just insane that that happened. After taking down Byron, we can meet up with the professor of the library, and we're instructed to investigate the lakes before Team Galactic sets off a bomb at Lake Valor. Wait, no, they got rid of the Doom text when the bomb goes off? <sighs> And that was the final straw for me. From here we head to Lake Valor, and oh wow, all the water is gone. I guess Team Galactic was a little thirsty. Upon entering the cave of Lake Valor, we battle the final commander Saturn, before heading back to Lake Verity to check on our friends. Naturally, we're once again just doing everyone else's work, and we have to battle Commander Mars again. After this battle, Primplop evolved into Empoleon. 
Once the area is cleared out, we meet with the professor, and he suggests that we head to Lake Acuity to check on our rival. After making it through the Celestic Town side of Mount Coronet, we reach Route 216, and we can make our way through the snow to the next city. As we're reaching the top, we can catch Snover, as well as get the item to unlock Rock Climb on our Pokich, which will be unlocked once we defeat the 7th Gym Leader. Remember when I said early in the video how busted Mew is in this game? It's about to get worse. If we head into the underground, we can access the northwest area of the map, and if we head into this icy cave room, we can grab the lucky egg to double our experience points. As far as I know, this, as well as every other item in the underground, is static, which gives Mew the opportunity to be high enough level to tank any major hits. Considering that we get this right before a bunch of huge battles, the potential for gaining a ton of levels is absurd. While we're down here, I figured it would be a smart idea to catch a few more Pokemon on the way, so I was able to grab Bronzor and Magnemite, and the Heart Home Egg finally hatched into Hapini. After resurfacing, we reach Snowpoint City, and realistically, the only thing you can do here is fight the gym. Out of all the gyms, this might be the easiest one of them all, because half of Maylene's team is weak to Flamethrower. It literally took twice as long to do the snow puzzle for the gym than it did for the actual battle. With that done, we've collected seven badges, and we can check on our rival. At Lake Acuity, we find out that Jupiter defeated him, and she mentions that the team is heading to the Galactic HQ to finalize their plans. Once we head to Fieldstone Sun City, we can talk to this grunt at the entrance to get the first key, which is going to help a lot because... Yeah, I don't think that's supposed to happen. Over on Diamond's side, we are able to evolve Staravia to Star Raptor and Hip Up a Toss into Hip Howdon from the Commander fights, and after following the same path, we make it to Veal Stone to take on the Headquarters. With the key, we can grab the Dust Stone for a future evolution, and slowly work at taking down every grunt on our path to the boss. In the main underground, we confront Cyrus and take down his team without any problems, and as a reward, he gives us the Master Ball. If you watched the last time I took on this gen, you know exactly what I'm going to be using these on, but we won't have to worry about having to use it for quite a while. From here, we're allowed in the testing room and have to face off against Commander Saturn. After defeating him, we're able to free the Lake Spirits, and he tells us that Team Galactic is heading to Mount Coronet to complete their final plans of summoning the legendary Pokémon. Before we scale the mountain, I stopped at the Orberg Lab to revive the fossil that we dug up earlier to get Cranidos. After taking down the grunts in the area, we reach the Spear Pillar and watch as Cyrus summons Dialga with the Red Chain and turns the entirety of Sinnoh into a rave. Before we try and stop him, we had to face off against the other two commanders with our rival joining us at the last minute. Overall, this battle isn't too difficult, and for some reason the game loves prioritizing your rival's Pokémon more than your own, but even without the extra help, I don't think it would have been too difficult to do alone. Once they're defeated, we watch as Dialga attempts to create a new galaxy, only for the Lake Spirits to arrive and destroy the Red Chain to free it from Cyrus. Naturally, this made him a bit upset, so we're now challenged to fight the giant troll doll to see who will take on the Legendary. Although this team is quite a bit stronger than 5 minutes ago, Mew has once again proven that the other 5 members of the team are just there for aesthetics, and after wiping his team, we've completed the Galactic storyline. Now the only thing left to do is take on the Legendary. Out of both of the box Legendaries, Dialga is arguably the harder of the two to catch solely off of the fact that its moves nearly one-shot the entire team, so admittedly this battle did take a couple of attempts because of how few turns you actually get. Thankfully, with Roar Time's cooldown, you can sneak in a heal, but as always, these battles are complete luck. After about 10 minutes, I was able to add it to the team, even though we all know it won't be used one bit. Now that we're all done with that, let's check on Pearl. Because of the large amount of battles you have to go through in Mount Coronet, I was able to include some Pokemon in the team for a bit to evolve Cricketot to Cricketune, Glammeow to Perugly, and Magnemite to Magneton, and then into Magnezone through being in Mount Coronet. As we scale the mountaintop, we can also catch Bronzong and Abomasnow before taking on the events at the top. When it came time to fight Palkia, for some reason I had a much easier time. In a way, this can be easier if it's daytime and you can't use dust balls because you can use net balls for nearly the same effectiveness, but when it comes to the damage that they deal to you, it's pretty much the same threat. With both legendaries taken down, we're finally able to head east of Valor Lakefront and quickly reach our destination. In Sunny Shore City, we meet Flynn, who instructs us to visit the gym leader in the lighthouse and try to convince him to go back and do his job. With the power of saying literally nothing, Volkner agrees to challenge us at the final gym. Because Mew doesn't really have any moves to cover electric types, this is honestly one of the harder gyms. Well, it would be if Volkner actually had electric type Pokemon. I just want to know what was going through their head. With every badge in the Sinnoh region obtained, there's really only one more challenge before we beat the entire game. The Elite Four. As we're leaving the city, we're stopped by Jasmine from Johto, who unlocks the ability to scale waterfalls so we can enter Victory Road. As you'd expect, this location gives you a ridiculous amount of experience, most notably the random Blissey that you have to fight, but also a lot of these battles help fill up the Sinnoh decks, which will make it significantly easier to complete when we need to. During these battles, Baneri evolved into Lopany, or if Ludwig is specifically watching, it evolved into Lopunny. I'm not saying you pronounce it wrong, I'm, I'm just saying it's not correct. So like content though. With all the trainers taken down and we finally made it to the end of the maze, it's time to do the final fights. All we need to do now is... 
This has happened too much in this video. Upon entering the Pokemon League, we have another battle with our rival, and after defeating him, there's nothing stopping us from taking on the Elite Four. Now, as you expect, this wasn't exactly hard to beat, but in comparison with the rest of the game, it definitely is. I made sure to stock about X items beforehand, and when you're plus four with all attacks, there is basically nothing that can live a single hit aside from Pokemon holding focus sashes and having sturdy. Out of all the members, Lucian was by far the hardest to take down, but that really was just because of bad luck. I really wish I had more to say about this section, but it shouldn't come as a surprise that my team was able to run through every battle. Initially, I thought that the champion battle against Cynthia was going to be the hardest one in the game, but her spirit tomb just goes for sucker punch until it runs out, so I just spammed X items until it didn't have any power points and then mopped her entire team. Is this the way the Pokemon company intended you to play the game? Definitely not. Did it make it significantly easier to beat? Absolutely. And with that, we've completed the main story of the games, but as you know, there's still a lot more that we have to do before we're done with the challenge. Before we check out the post game, let's just finish up Diamond's story. Considering the only things you can do after catching the Legendary is beat the 8th Gym and take on the League, there isn't really anything unique that this game did differently, but Coranidos did evolve into Rampardos in Volkner's Gym. The only other notable thing is that the Razor Claw had to be obtained in this game in Victory Road for a Pokemon that we're going to catch in the post game, but aside from that, this game did all the same things. Well, except for the whole jumping through a person thing. With the Elite Four and Cynthia defeated once again, we can now take a look at the post game where the games are assigned very different tasks. As I mentioned a few times in this video, the first thing that needs to be done is completing the Sinnoh Dax. In these games, you're unable to do essentially the entire story if you haven't seen all 150 Pokemon in the main story, and thankfully since I planned ahead, I'm only missing a few. A lot of these are Pokemon that only appear from fishing or surfing, but there are definitely a few that are special events in the game. If we head back to Lake Acuity in Snowpoint City, we can head into the cavern. In Inside, we can take on our first lake spirit, Uxie. Because I use the amulet coin for a majority of the game, we're more than well off when it comes to dusk balls, and since the team is still pretty decently even on levels, we don't even have to deal with the same issues that we had with Dialga. After throwing a few balls, we're able to add it to the total. We're also going to grab another one of these Pokemon, but the method to get it is a lot different. If we enter the cave in Lake Verity, we can find Mesprit, but instead of battling it now, it will just instead fly away. Professor Rowan then tells us that Mesprit will roam around the region, and we might randomly come across it, but thankfully, I have a better idea. If you head to this building in Jubilife City, you can obtain the marking map on your Pokich. This will allow us to see exactly what route the Pokemon is on without having to find it on a random route. Because it bounces all around the region, all you have to do is take a step in and out of a route until it eventually lands in the same location as you. Now when you encounter this, it will always flee on the first turn, so this is easily the best time to use that Master Ball that Cyrus gave to us. In total, this took like 5 minutes to do, and this catch leaves us with only one more Pokemon to complete the Sinnoh Dex. The last Pokemon that we have to encounter is Drifloon. Now this specific Pokemon only appears in the Valley Windworks on Friday mornings, and the game is set up so you have to wait an entire week for it to appear. Fortunately, if you just change your Switch's clock to that date, it should appear, but there is a big caveat to this that we'll cover a bit later. With a single quick ball, we can add to the total. With our now completed Pokedex, we can head back to Sand Gem Town and talk to Professor Rowan and Oak, and our Pokedex will be upgraded to National Mode. Not only does this open up more of the map, but it also gives us a ton of new Pokemon available to catch that we couldn't grab in the base game. Because the majority of these encounters are in the Grand Underground, we're going to save that for last and take on basically everything that's in the main region. Before we do that, if we head back to the Valor Lakefront and go into this building, we can talk to one of the game developers and receive the Catching Charm to potentially help with the rest of this challenge. This isn't related to the challenge, but if you also talk to the sound engineer, you'll get DS sounds, which replaces all the music in the game with the original songs and sounds, which was a very welcome addition to this remake. Now let's run through a few cleanup encounters. At Lake Valor, we can catch Staravia, Chatot on Route 222, and Sneasel on Route 217. If we head back to Heart Home and go to the house to the right of the Pokemon Center, we can talk to Bebe, who will give us an Eevee for beating the game. We'll take care of this evolution when we get to the final grind. From here, we can go to Snowpoint City and take the boat to the Battle Zone. Here we meet our rival and Buck, but we're going to completely ignore the post-game story in this version and leave all that responsibility to Pearl. This game has a much larger task that it has to complete. The island does, however, have a ton of evolution items, so it's important that we grab a few of those before we leave. If we talk to this man, we can get the Super Rod. On Route 229, we can grab the Reaper Cloth. And on the route above, we can get the Shiny Stone to complete all of our tasks for this place. Heading back to the mainland, if we enter the Eterna Forest at nighttime, we can complete another event. Inside the old chateau, there is a room upstairs with a TV. If we interact with it at nighttime, we're able to thump the TV, which allows us to catch Rotom. Despite the legendary music, this Pokemon is extremely easy to catch, but this is honestly one of my favorite events in the entire game. After this, I went back to Route 205 and used the Super Rod to catch Lumineon, which finishes all the above ground encounters for the time being. Before we go underground, I made sure to grab the Shiny Stone from inside Mount Coronet for another evolution that we'll address later. 
So as you'd expect with how low the total is so far in the challenge, a majority of the rest of the encounters are found in the underground solely out of convenience, and admittedly to avoid making literally the exact same video I uploaded two years ago. Although encounters are really important, there is also another thing we have to hunt for. Once you receive the national decks, mysterious shards will appear in the underground digging spots. These are relatively rare, and we're going to need 9 small shards, 3 large shards, or a combination of the two before we can leave. So I made sure to mine every location I saw before heading to another area to catch Pokemon. While I was doing this, I managed to catch Gibble, Tukabite, and a male Ralts in Fountain Spring Cave, Murkrow and Mantike in the Stillwater Cavern, Macargo in Volcanic Cave for Breeding, Elikid, Ditto, and Dusclops in the Dazzling Cave, and two Krogunk and Tangrowth in Swampy Cave. The greatest encounter that I managed to get from this hunt, however, was Turtwig, as you can catch every starter in the decks in the underground, which completely eliminates the need for using a third game in this challenge. During this time, Drifloon evolved into Drifblim, Sneasel evolved into Weavile, and Gabite evolved into Garchomp. It's also important that when you're catching Elekid to make sure it's holding an Electorizer so it can be evolved later. After spending a bit more time underground, we're finally able to get the last Mysterious Shard, which allows us to take on yet another brand new location to the game. Now if you haven't got around to playing this game yet, you're probably wondering what they did with the PAL Park, considering that its old functionality isn't possible on this console. This area has been renamed to Ravana's Park, and essentially it's similar to the Ultra Wormholes in Sun and Moon, as you can obtain every Legendary from Generations 1 through 3. Although none of these are the Sinnoh Pokemon, the Reggie Trio is required for an event in this game, so we're forced into catching all three of them in order to complete the challenge. At the counter, we can exchange these shards for slates, and if we enter the respective shrine, we can insert the slate and battle a random Reggie. I don't know who produced the battle theme for this location, but they absolutely deserve a raise for how good this is. As you expect, trying to catch them isn't anything crazy, but since all of them know Zap Cannon, which paralyzes the opponent, Mew is able to synchronize the effect back to make catching them a lot easier. After about 10 minutes, we were able to catch Regirock, Registeel, and finally Regice. During this, Elekid evolved into Electabuzz, and Turtwig evolved into Grottle. With a new collection of beasts, we can head back to Snowpoint City and enter the temple. In the basement, if we have all three of them in our party and interact with the Pokemon in the center, we can battle against Regigigas. To my surprise, this was probably one of the easiest legendaries that had to be caught in this game, but I think a big part of that was just because of its ability making it useless for the first few turns. Also after this battle, Apom evolved into Ambipom. Now that's all completed, all we have to do now is prepare for the grinding section. I realized at this point I completely forgot to grab some evolution items, so I spent some time grabbing the upgrade and the dubious disc for later. From here we can head to Celestion Town and start breeding all the Pokemon that we need. Because we grabbed a cargo earlier, hatching the eggs didn't take very long to complete. After biking around for a bit, we were able to get two Turtwig, two Chimchar, Kranidos, Eevee, and Drifloon. Now let's finish up Pearl. Because Diamond had to spend so much time collecting all the mysterious shards, Pearl has to basically take care of nearly all the post-game events, however there are still plenty more things that need to be done underground. While we're completing the Sinnoh Dax, we're able to fish for Finneon on Route 205, collect the Soothe Bell from the mansion on Route 212 to help with more friendship evolutions, and make our way to Iron Island to complete our first event. As we're heading through the floors, we meet Riley and have to go through another one of those co-op quests and take on some galactic grunts. After defeating them, Riley gives us an egg for a Pokemon that you can only get in this location. In addition, as you leave Iron Island, you can collect a shiny stone, which we'll use for another evolution. The last Pokemon required for the Sinnoh Dax is the final Lake Spirit, Azelf. This one easily took the longest time, but it only took like 10 balls, so it wasn't too much trouble. With the National Dex in hand, we're free to explore the second island, however, there are a couple more things on the mainland that we can take care of. If we head back to Candelave City and go into this house, we can find a boy in his bed having a nightmare. If we talk to the sailor at the dock, he'll offer us to take us to Full Moon Island to try and find a cure to wake him up. Upon arriving there, we encounter Cresselia, which activates the second rolling Pokemon for this game. Fortunately, we were able to find this one on the marking map even faster than Mesprit, and with the last Master Ball used, we can take care of this quest. Now let's take on the Grand Underground. In comparison to Diamond, there really isn't much to grab down here, however we will be coming back to this area at the end to take care of one more task. In the Dazzling Cave, we can catch Togepi and Ditto, Lickitung, Rhydon, and Chingling in the Spacious Cave, Swinob, Tuscarupi, and Gligar in Swampy Cave, a female Snowrun in Icy Cave, and Magby and Macargo in Volcanic Cave. During this, the egg from Riley hatched in Riolu. After all that is taken care of, we can head back to the battle area and explore the entire island. Heading through the desert, we can grab another shiny stone, as well as the protector, before meeting Crash Awake and arrival at the base of Stark Mountain. We also meet up with Buck, who tells us that they're going to try and find the magma stone deep within the mountain, and we make our way through the cave trying to beat him to it. 
Eventually, you're forced into another co-op mission with Bach, and although there are a ton of trainers in the area, you can skip all but one battle, so if you know how to navigate through the maze, it's really easy. At the end, Buck steals the magma stone, and he says he's going back to his house in the survival area. After visiting him there, he got bored of having it or something, and leaves to return it back to the mountain. After going through the entire area again, you can re-enter the room and find Heatran. In my opinion, this is arguably one of the worst side quests in the game, if not the series, because you just have to do the same task back to back, but thankfully I knew the fastest path to get to the room, so this whole event only took about 20 minutes to complete. After the battle, Skorupi evolved into Drapion, Swineup evolved into Pile of Swine, and Riolu evolved into Lucario. With that done, we basically never have to touch this area again, so let's head back to the mainland and see what else we have to do. At this point, I had completely forgotten to revive the fossil we got earlier, and after redeeming it, we were able to get Shield on. If we head south of Vealstone City, to the east there should now be an opening that leads to Spring Path where we can enter Turnback Cave. In this area you have to choose the correct door four times in order to reach the deepest chamber. This is entirely based on luck, but to avoid getting sent back to the beginning, all you have to do is avoid entering the same door that you previously entered, and realistically you should make it to the end after going through about 10 rooms. Once you make it to the center, you can confront Giratina. My luck for this battle was absolutely insane. I basically dodged every move that it used on me, and I ended up getting a back-to-back -back freeze with Ice Beam after it thawed out on the same turn. After three Dust Balls, we were able to add this to the total. Now let's get to breeding. After biking around, we hatched two Piplup and Riolu. During this process, I started to check all the honey trees, and I actually found Burmy, which like I mentioned earlier, is the only Pokemon you need to grab from these, so this was super clutch to find at the end. Because we need a couple more, I was able to breed another two males, which finishes off all of our catches. Now it's time to grind. As you'd expect, considering the Pokemon in the underground are level 60, this is one of the better places to grind, but to be fair, most of the Pokemon that need to evolve are one level away from evolving, so although there are probably better locations, it doesn't take too much time to complete. The only exception to grinding in this area are the Pokemon that evolve based on location, but I'll cover that as we go along. After taking out a bunch of wild encounters, we are able to evolve our catches to get Eevee to Leafeon in the Eterna Forest, Eevee to Glaceon in Route 216, Chimchar to Monferno, Turtwig to Grottle, the second Grottle to Torterra, Krogunk to Toxicroak, Shieldon to Basiodon, Ralts to Curlia, Curlia to Gallade with the Dawnstone, Roselia to Roseray with the Shiny Stone, and Murkrow to Honchkrow with the Dust Stone. In Pearl, we were able to evolve our catches to get Piplup to Primplup, the female Burmy to Wormadam, the male Burmy to Motham, Lickitung to Licky Licky, Piloswine to Mamoswine, Gligar to Gliscor, Togepi to Togetic, Togetic to Togekiss with the Shiny Stone, Snowrun to Frostlass with the Dawn Stone, and Mistrevious into Miss Magius with the Dust Stone. From here we can take care of the trade evolution Pokemon to get Rhydon to Rhyperior with the Protector, Electabuzz to Electivire with the Electorizer, Magmar to Magmortar with the Magmarizer, and Dustcloths into Dust Noir with the Reaper Cloth. Now let's take on one more task. If we head back to Silesian Town and go south, we can find a crumbling tower. If we use the odd keystone, it will be converted into the Hollow Tower, which activates a classic event in the underground. However, it is a lot different than last time. Now originally, in order to summon Spiritomb from the tower, you were required to speak to 32 people underground. Because the old games didn't keep track of the individual trainers, you could essentially just go in and out of the area with another game and talk to them 32 times, rather than actually interact with that many people. In these games, however, they remove that feature and replace it with NPCs. Throughout each area of the Grand Underground, there are 32 NPCs that you have to find, and I would personally like to speak to the person who set this up the way that they did. Nearly each area that's surrounded by dens contains a specific character, with a chance of a couple others appearing as well. As you can probably guess, all you have to do is run around through the entirety of the underground and talk to each character. To make a long story short, the first 31 took an hour to find, not that bad, but the final 30 second character took me another entire hour because the one location that contained this NPC gave me the same character 6 times in a row, so I just assumed that it wasn't there. The best piece of advice I can give you is to take a screenshot of your map and write down every person that you see in each area, because the game won't do it for you. At some point I'll probably make a guide and include it in the description, so if you're seeing this a while after it drops, check in the description and I might be able to help you out. Thankfully when it comes to actually fighting Spiritomb, it's extremely easy to catch, so this took no time at all to finish. Now at this point you're probably thinking, that's definitely not all the Pokemon, so are you getting them? And the answer to that is yes, and also no. Let's break it down. Now, in the original games, you could change the date to 1159, wait for the game to roll over to the next day, and refresh the daily events, and that got fixed in this game. 
To my knowledge, there isn't an exploit, but I'm sure at some point people will find a trick to bypass it, but that essentially means that you have to wait a full calendar day to see the next Swarm, Great Marsh, and Trophy Garden Pokemon. Thankfully, the Great Marsh is a little easier to find what you need, so the day after in Pearl, I was able to catch Carnivine and Yanma, who I then evolved into Yan Mega, but the last two Pokemon aren't as simple. Nosepass is only available in Daily Swarms, and Porygon is only available through the Trophy Garden as they remove the GIF one that you get from Platinum in Vealstone City. I tried finding it on both copies for 3 days and didn't get it, so unfortunately it's not possible to catch everything in 24 hours. In addition, the mythicals in this game are also not obtainable as the game literally just came out, so Darkrai, Shaman, and Arceus can't be obtained legitimately until their respective items are released. Manaphy, on the other hand, is a different story. If you connect a Mystery Gift, you can receive a free Manaphy as an early purchase bonus. This event only goes until February 21st of 2022, so eventually this challenge will become even more impossible, but if you check your Mystery Gift at the time this video goes up, you should be able to get one. With breeding to get Fione, this gives us a total of 102 out of 107 Sinnoh Pokemon, and this is unfortunately the end of the challenge. But how did I do? So let's review. In Diamond, we finished literally at the buzzer with a time of 11 hours and 57 minutes, and in Pearl, we finished with 11 hours and 23 minutes. In all honesty, Pearl would have finished this a lot faster if it didn't have to spend two entire hours hunting Spiritomb, but I'm very glad that I made that decision or the times would have been really lopsided. I know I didn't complete the challenge on this one, but I genuinely tried my best to get everything. Although I could have waited to get the clips for all of those encounters, considering that there are about 20 of each Swarm and Trophy Pokemon, this video could have taken nearly a month to come out, and considering that I haven't uploaded in forever, I really wanted to come back to the new game's release because I miss making content. Speaking of that, like I mentioned in the beginning of the video, I'm working on a gigantic video that I've spent literally the entire year completing. I've talked about it a lot on stream, which if you aren't following me, I would highly suggest that because I'm going to be playing the remakes every day until I've done basically everything. This is the most ambitious project that I've ever worked on, and its file size is literally larger than the entirety of my upload history on this channel, so hopefully that explains my absence. If you want to stay updated on that, you can follow me on Twitter or Instagram, and I post occasional hints about it. Aside from the daily events, I think this is a pretty fun remake to run through, and if you end up doing this yourself, let me know how fast you completed it in the comments below. Aside from that, that's going to do for today's video. If you liked the video, leave a like and subscribe for more content. I have tons of plans for the remakes, and I'll be streaming a lot of the challenges on Twitch if you're curious about the process of how I make them. If you're feeling wacky, leave a comment as it helps with my videos, and follow me on all my socials if you want to see more of what I do. Other than that, like thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you on the next one.